Alexander, it's a pleasure to have you as my guest. Welcome to the J Curve. Oh, I'm so pumped to be here in person now in New York. So thank you for the invitation. I want to start with a little bit on you. You've started your professional career as a rescue doctor in the fire department. So I wanted to understand better what prompted you to go to med school and start your career as a doctor in the emergency. I came from a family of doctors. My father used to be a heart surgeon, such an inspirational guy for me. My older sister, a dermatologist. So I went to med school and I graduated out of Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, UFRJ. When I finished med school, there was this test going on, and it's not every year that we could apply for this test, for the fire department. And there I was, 24 years old, already interested in entrepreneurship, but really want to practice the skills that I have learned in the med school. And I thought, man, this is my opportunity to do something good for the society. Luckily, I was able to to be part of the, the class, and it was life-changing for me because I learned a lot and also the discipline came to my life. Since then, I've been applying discipline, this military discipline for everything that I touch. So it was a great experience. I've stayed there for two years and then I needed to, to leave because it was not easy to, in parallel, being a high school doctor and launching my first company. You mentioned that your father was a strong role figure for you. Definitely. So what are some of the key things that he taught you as you were growing up? Wow, deep question. Definitely, uh, my father, he's still alive, uh, luckily, uh, not when working anymore as a heart surgeon, but for him it was not work. He was paid for, but he would do that without any salary. So this kind of passion and this kind of calling, I believe was something that I always looked for. This was really inspirational for me. So it could be Sunday, if someone needs him, they would just pager him. And that's a good point. We're gonna talk about Beep Saud and Beep, the name of the company comes from these, this feeling. The my beeping fa- sound yeah, of definitely. the pager? <laughs> we were having dinner, and then it was Sunday night, and then my father was beeped, and he needed to go, and it was like a superhero for me, going to rescue someone. And when we founded BP seven years ago, it was bam, BP will be the name, and that's why we called the company, we found the company with this name. So it has a connection with my father and how strong was this inspiration for me. Wow, you have such a tight connection to your early childhood experience. But just like you said, Bip Saudi, which today is the leading in-house healthcare startup, and I would not even probably call it a startup anymore, company yeah. in Brazil, Backed by David Velez, oh, yeah. Valor Capital, Zuckerberg Chan Foundation, which yeah. is the first investment in impact driven company in Latin America. So that's super impressive. Actually, CZI, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, they had already invested in one edutech in Brazil, a brilliant guy, Marcos from Descomplica, but they were ah, followers. Yeah, they had already backed him following a SoftBank leading round. But it was the first time CZI, the Chain Zuckerberg Initiative, invested in a health tech startup. And it was in Brazil and it was in BIP. So I'm very proud uh, of that. Now, it's super important and it's not an easy task to get an investment like that. It talks a lot about the scale and the impact of what you're driven. But like you said, you've started with BR Med and BR Med is the chain of occupational clinics in Brazil that you started in 2008, Perfect. and it was a completely different experience, right? Yeah. Here you have all these big brand names on your cap table, which right now is great, probably in the recession, helpful, I guess. But back then you started with bootstrapping the company. Talk to me a little bit about your experience of building and scaling BR Med and some of the key learnings that you've transferred to BP. It's always good having the benefit of the hindsight, looking back. So I was 24, just out of the med school, 
with this willing to become entrepreneur. So I started studying everything I could have found about it. And then my best friend, that's also called Davi, he was already being an internship in an occupational health clinic. He was also a doctor, right? Yeah, yeah. And he as, is. as you can see, we live among doctors. So my father, actually my wife is also a doctor, our best friends are doctors. So my co-founder, Davi, as I was saying, he was an intern in an occupational health clinic. And I like to say that entrepreneurship is all about seeing things that are not working or at least could work better. And just by watching him in this clinic, we start saying, hey, man, it could work better in a different way. And then together, we co-found BR Med. So BR stands for Brazil, as you can imagine. So it was 2008. And back then, Olga, actually, I didn't know about venture capital. I didn't have uh, money. I didn't inherit anything. So it was just about being profitable since day one. So I was working as a medical doctor in the rescue mm -hmm. department, night shifts. And during the day, I was with the v founding our first company. So basically, occupational health in Brazil is the area of medicine where you perform exams in employees that are just about to be hired for a specific company. Employers can outsource these medical exams. We start closing contracts with big companies and we needed to scale it. And at the time, I didn't know the word bootstrapping. It was a survive mode, a real life MBA. So I had to learn <laughs> every, the best MBA Yes, you can the get. real life MBA. There is no MBA that you can pay that will teach you the lessons that I've learned during this phase. I was 24, 25. All my friends were having party a lot. And I was there working around the clock to make sure that we survive. So during this time, we had different administrations. We changed a lot since then. Now you are back to the left wing. So I saw all kinds of Brazil and we were able to survive. So it created something, uh, a real strength that we can rely on in situations like this. So it's good to, to have this experience. Uh, it took us 10 years to create what you can call a successful company. So it was not an overnight success. It was not a Hollywood story that we received a lot of money from VC. No, it was one day after another, just working a lot and make sure that we have the right unit economics, could be able to expand our, our user base, close new contracts. So balancing out everything. And then we create a 600 full-time employee company operating in six Brazilian states, profitable since day one. And then I was there 33, 34, I was 34. And I noticed that, okay, this is a B2B company and it's profitable, it's growing. Now there is this senior management team that I can rely on. It was 2016. I remember waking up and realizing that at that time we had apps for all our daily demands. So we have in Brazil iFood, WhatsApp, Uber also. We have all kinds of apps for our daily demands. But what about healthcare? Just to give context to your audience, healthcare accounts for 10% of Brazilian GDP. And man, it's such an important thing. And even now, we don't have one app that the majority of Brazilians have installed on their smartphones. I have so many follow-up mm -hmm. questions. And I think I want to start following up on your entrepreneurial drive. Okay. You have a lot of energy. Yeah. And I witnessed that, <laughs> okay. for sure. Given that you're coming from a family of doctors and you're surrounded by doctors, what feeds your entrepreneurial drive? Good question, Olga. So for me, I can tell you, this is my calling. It's something that I cannot avoid. I cannot be in a situation and just seeing opportunities and not jumping into it. My short answer to your question is, it's my calling. And I hope everyone can find your calling because it's amazing when you see yourself being paid, being uh, celebrated for doing something that you do with no salary. So it connects me with what my father taught me without knowing that he was teaching me that at the moment. It's you know, just, my ultimate test for any initiative is if I'm ready to do it for free for an extended period of time, I'll go ahead and do it. Otherwise, no. Turns out that people that operate like this earn more money than they can 
imagine. So because to them, money is not an end game, right? Yeah. The end game is something bigger than that, and money is an output. When I was younger, and I was listening to people saying that, oh, it's bullshit. Come on, they are just telling that because they are recording. No, come on, I'm being 100% honest and transparent here. So for me, it's all about calling. Find your calling, and we need all kind of callings. You need everyone, every kind of professions. So be entrepreneur. And now it's a good moment to talk about it because we are living this VC industry in winter. So it's not that good be entrepreneur in moments like now as it was in 2021. So now we will probably see the entrepreneurs that really love what they do. Because I see a lot of people going back to consultancy firms. Now there is no hype around entrepreneurship. But I love the game. I love being part of the of it. Well, I think that's the ultimate benefit of you being in this game for such a long period Definitely. of time and seeing all this multitude of crises. And when you look around on the founder community, what do you think are the skills, the traits of founders who stay in the game besides passion? So I could stay for at least one hour giving you examples, <laughs> but there is something that for me is really important when I have this first part of conversation and when someone comes to me and says, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. Okay, why you want to be an entrepreneur? Is just because you saw me on Instagram? This is just less than 1% of our lives. So make sure that you are not jumping into this fashion, this way of life, just seeking out this kind of... Fame. Uh, yes, seeking out fame. fame. Yeah, definitely. And followership and influence, yeah. right? But the second part, how well do you deal with risk, with uncertainty? Because if you want to know where you're going to be in five or ten years, don't become an entrepreneur. Because we have plans, we all have spreadsheets, but we know that... It's just a kind of a guidance, but we'll need to deal with unexpected problems and issues that will pop up down the road. So make sure that this is your calling and make sure that you have the proper mental health or the mindset to deal with uncertainty. Because as you know, Olga, as a, also entrepreneur here, there are days when you believe that you're going to be the next Zuckerberg and hours after you are living this near-death experience. So it's a roller coaster. It's not for everyone. I have a lot of friends. They will go work on this big corporation. They can plan their future, and the odds are really high that they will nail it. So in five years, I will be earning this. This will be my salary. I will be living here. As an entrepreneur, you don't even know if you're going to be alive. And maybe you are alive and you are the rock star. So this range, this wide range, living with these possibilities is not for everyone. You know, it's funny, but I don't know if you're following. We have this Elizabeth Holmes saga. Definitely. And it's so interesting how you can go from being on top of the world, wearing black turtleneck, you know, having this deep throat voice to a person who is trying to completely reinvent herself and build an image of wife and mother. It is a roller coaster, and it's not about even judging the scale of failures, but it's about how fast you go from one extreme to another extreme and how well you actually need to manage that perception, right, and manage Perfect. this reality. And don't break and don't break mentally. And, and if you are married, you need to make sure that your family understand that you're going to have good and bad days. So I'm all about showing people the pros and cons of being an entrepreneur, because I believe that if we don't talk about it, we will see a lot of depression. We will see a lot of people burning all their savings on trying to launch a new endeavor just because they saw someone doing that. They saw someone on magazines. So let's talk honestly about being an entrepreneur. So you mentioned being an entrepreneur in 2021 and yeah. being an entrepreneur today. And it's a dramatic difference because a lot of people entered the entrepreneurship in 2021 with this false perception that you can always raise money is in abundance mm -hmm. and you can always grow and growth is correlated with the amounts of money that you can raise. Definitely. Right. And right now everybody has to face the tough reality that those two things are not that connected. If you have a true meaning to what you're doing, you're building that no matter the environment, if you can raise, of course, who says no to money, right? But yeah. if you can't raise, it doesn't prevent you from 
keeping going. Before we transition to BR Med and your learnings, you mentioned your wife and the conversations you have and how much support she provides. And also, I remember when we talked before, you mentioned that, especially in the case of Bipa Saudi, because you were a solo founder, yeah. that creating the system of support in terms of having the right family, friends, and also Endeavor, Brazil, was mission critical to your continual success. Can you talk a little bit about that? And why is that important to have system of support and mentorship? Wow. I, I, you see, we have like a lot of philosophical discussion. Yeah, right definitely. And it's so good <laughs> because just talking about how good we are and all the money we've raised and everything. No, come on. Let's try to... But you to, know what? You're good. We yeah, have to admit that. You're good. I appreciate I appreciate. <laughs> so, first of all, marriage. I like to say to all to early stage entrepreneurs that when you become an entrepreneur, you bring with you all your inner circle. So make sure that they sign up for this adventure with you. <laughs> Are you going to support me? Are you in a good moment? Having this proper conversation with your spouse, it's definitely important. And uh, of course, prior to that, choosing the right, in my case, the right wife. And what I mean by right wife is someone that will be there to support your dreams. And mutually, of course. I can't imagine staying with someone that would not be able to understand these bad and good days that entrepreneurs have. So they need to adapt really fast because on Monday, I'm so happy, <laughs> good, crazy news, and something really good is about to happen. And on Tuesday, she needs to deal with a husband that's, oh, I'm sad, or oh, I'm pissed. <laughs> and being my wife, it's not easy. She has been such an important How part. long have you been married? Married seven years, Okay. but together more than 14 years. And two kids, so okay. it's my co-founder in life. Wow. Not really in none of my companies, but definitely in life. The founder in life. I have yeah. to borrow it sometime. <laughs> okay, so wife, how about the friendship component and endeavor or maybe just the founder's network component? Perfect. So friends. I have this different opinion about friendship. So I have a couple of good friends that are really like family. Probably it comes from different lives, I don't know, the, the connection so strong, and I can't imagine going throughout all these situations without them, so... How do you define friendship? You mentioned that wow. you have a different way to look at it, so what's your definition of friendship? The person that you call when something really good happens to you and you can definitely see how happy they are just because what happened to you. So this is true friendship. It's like you are an extension of each other. And I'm so lucky my co-founder, my first company, is kind of a brother for me, definitely. So he's the godfather of my older son. I'm the godfather of two of his four kids. So definitely wife, these real friends in Endeavor. I like to say that Endeavor for me, how do you call that organization AA? The Alcoholicals, this group, the support group for uh, addiction. Oh, okay. How do you call it? <laughs> okay. yeah, 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 I understand what you're yeah. saying. So <laughs> it's where I can talk about my struggles. It's a kind of a peer circle. So you can share experience. Because once again, my wife will be there for me. But I can't discuss with her any cash flow issue. So it's not her. She's an anesthesiologist. She will be there. She will pass me a glass of wine and say, hey, baby. I trust you, I will be with you no matter what. This is the kind of support she can give me. But there are other technical support that only in places like Endeavor. Tried several different entrepreneur groups prior to Endeavor, but Endeavor was the one who brought together all the great entrepreneurs and similar entrepreneurs. So it's different when you inherit a company and you are the third generation. It's not bad or worse, but totally different challenges that you face. At Endeavor, we are more people, founders that start the company from scratch. We probably face similar issues, similar challenges, so we can share experience, we can be vulnerable. I just came from Scotts Valley, one hour from Silicon Valley. I was there for the Endeavor Entrepreneur Outliers. It's like Disney for an entrepreneur. I was happy as a kid at Disney, so... And I hope I can qualify because this event, you need to be a 5% 
top uh, endeavor entrepreneur around the world to be qualified. So it definitely raised my bar. You know, when I interviewed Camila Junqueira for, oh, for the podcast a while ago, one of the things she told me about the acceptance rate towards Endeavor, and it was mind blowing because yeah. acceptance rate is lower than that of Stanford. It was, it was easier to become a medical doctor, definitely. <laughs> But the other thing she told me that one of the key measure of evaluation process is the desire of the entrepreneur to give back, Definitely. to be engaged with the community and mentor the community. And I think maybe that's what makes it so special because the motivation behind starting businesses across different industries is very similar. Like you want to expand the size of the pie versus you get your bigger size of an existing pie. Ah, I couldn't agree more. Being able to access people. Let me give you an example. You are from the VC industry. You probably heard about Martin Scobari, the head of, of General, General Atlantic. Atlantic. Imagine if an entrepreneur just tried to cold call him. Probably will not be able to talk to him. Although, you know what? I called email David Vales and, back in Stanford and, and he it? responded. It's amazing. Right David, away. I, I don't know how, maybe he's an ex man. I, I don't know how he can deal with, with his scheduling. I don't do it uh, every week, but every time I send them a message, in like one hour, okay, I can meet you, I can talk with you tomorrow. And so I don't know how they prioritize, but it's amazing how busy they are and how can be able to fast answer. But going back to Endeavor. Escobari. Escobari. So I was in my process to become an Endeavor entrepreneur. And there I was with Martin Escobari for one hour, and he was preparing me for the, the selection panel. Because as you know, we have this national panel, and if you are accept, you have the international panel. So it's a two steps process. So he was there with me for one hour, Of course, he hit hard because he can recognize really fast all the issues of your business. And you know what, Vander? This will happen. This will happen. I said, no, Martin, oh, come on. And six months later, it's amazing. Uh, his ability and all those seasoned entrepreneurs, previous entrepreneurs and now VCs, how they can recognize patterns. This is the kind of network that Endeavor can provide you. So on a monthly basis, at least I talk with three or four early stage entrepreneurs, especially in the health space where I can be more useful. On the other hand, I have at least one or two mentorship with people like Martin Scobari. For example, I was just talking with the CFO of Mercado Libre, one of the biggest companies in Latin America, probably the biggest company in Latin America. And he was there with me for one hour, just trying to help me with some material that I was preparing. So this is Endeavor. And definitely the right place if your calling is entrepreneurship. Who are your most important mentors? And what are oh. some of the pieces of advice that you got from them that impacted the direction of your business or maybe personal growth? Of course, I, I don't want to be unfair, but there was one that changed the way I thought about Bip Saúde. Just give context, Bip Saúde is an at-home healthcare service. So we started offering vaccine at home. We became the leading vaccine company in Brazil. Then we expand to lab tests at home. We are growing really fast in this great business. And we have plans to keep expanding to other business units, such as infusions, drug delivery. So we want to be this go-to app for healthcare service in Brazil. And then I was having this mentorship with Diego Barreto. Diego is the CFO and CSO of iFood. And if someone doesn't know, iFood is the biggest, a behemoth regarding food delivery in Brazil. It has, what, 80% of the food delivery market in Brazil and 60% in Latin From America? From what I heard, Uber Eats left Brazil because of them. Just to give you an idea of what a great company they are and such inspiration for us. After this mentorship, I started seeing my own company at least half healthcare and half logistics company, people may be wondering, why a logistic company? So as I was saying, we offer at-home service. But you know, what really set us apart from our competitors is the last mile logistic tech that we've developed, this proprietary technology, and how we are able to create this gel density to optimize our cars and our team By doing that, we can offer this great service at affordable price. There will be no, no magic offering great service, charging 
a high price. The first time I visited iFood was in 2019. My friend from Stanford, he's VP of restaurants in iFood, wow. and they gave me this incredible presentation of the core capabilities. And the core capabilities of iFood was exactly the precision with which they could estimate the time and the logistics around the last mile delivery was super impressive. But going back to Beep, can you tell me a little bit about what Beep is today, how it started, how it's going? So this is, once again, the calling and this inevitable way of thinking and behaving. We decided to launch Bib to become this go-to app. For example, if we are sitting in a, around a table like this in Brazil and someone says, oh, I need Tanana. And if this Tanana is in the healthcare industry or someone else around the table say, hey, check Bib. So you will find whatever you need there. Amazon, Mercado Libre, all these companies, they are really inspiration for us. We want to be like this in the healthcare space. It's interesting, but you immediately thought that it has to be like the getaway for Brazilian in terms of healthcare, or you were focused on particular niche like vaccinations or testing. You know what really drove me at that time was creating this go-to app because come on, it's not possible that I still need to organize all my data, my medical data. When I need some kind of a service in the healthcare space, I need to call the doctor's office in business hours. So it was so such a pain in there, so much friction. Huh? So much friction. And at this time, we were seeing New Bank and other great companies with this native digital approach raising rising and so I thought man we need to do something in the healthcare space and if no one's gonna do I'm gonna do so definitely we found people with this big idea this big vision of becoming this go-to app the super app this one-stop shop for healthcare service but this is the beauty about being a seasoned entrepreneur even when you have this huge dream we know that you need to address a small part first and then other than another, we saw this clear trend of people buying online and delivering. So Mercado Libre was growing really fast, Amazon. So I thought to myself, man, this trend is coming to healthcare. I'm not inventing anything new. I just want to bring this behavior to the healthcare space. We tried several services prior to vaccine. It's important to share that. For one year, things were not doing well. So what did you try? We try a medical appointment at home. We're trying to be a, a scheduling app for image exams. So we tried several things. And once again, I like to share this because I don't want things to believe that it was a it's overnight. It's like magic. Yeah, you know, so you start and it worked and now you are this big company in Brazil. One year going back home and telling my wife, I don't know what's happening. I have done this before. It should be easier and even as a second time entrepreneur, it was definitely not easy. Then I learned one of my biggest lessons. The real CEO of the company is the customer. So I was trying to push them something that I believe they want. And then I start hearing them. We were offering medical appointments at home. And what they really want was vaccine at home for their babies. You as a mother know that the smaller the baby is, the harder it is to go with them and find a clinic for vaccination. So it's really hard to move around, especially in Brazil, all the traffic and all the violence. So much more convenient someone coming to do it at home. In Brazil at that time, there were some options to schedule at home service, but it was for VIP. It was uh, really expensive. It's like so, premium, premium product. Definitely. Once again, there is no magic offering convenient service charging this high price. So how can we address this? And then we came up with the idea of the dark stores. I don't like to use the word dark in the health space. It <laughs> doesn't have a good fit, but definitely is a concept that we all know, dark stores, dark kitchens. Can you define it a little bit for those who are listening and don't definitely. know? So there are a lot of restaurants nowadays that don't have opened a location for a client or customer to walk in. They only have these kitchens, that's why they call dark kitchen, to prepare your order and send at home. 
with this concept, we create the same in the healthcare space. Of course, we have our facilities and we have to apply for the license, all the regulatory aspects. But once we are ready to start offering our service, we close the doors and we use this area only as a dispatch room, kind of a, a small fulfillment center where our team will start the day. And what I mean by our team, I'm talking about drivers, nurses, and all the inventory that we need will be there. And they will departure from that place and they will visit the clients that schedule through our app. So basically we started like this and then once our clients asked for vaccine and we heard then, we started offering vaccine and boom, this is was when we finally found our product market fit. Since then we have been growing, I don't know, more than 100% year over year. Now we are operating in six Brazilian states with more than 1,000 full-time employees. NEPS is our North Star. What is it now? It's 95. It's so still 95. 95. Wow. And, you know, my mood is directly correlated <laughs> with the NEPS. The <laughs> NEPS is the most important thing. I believe it pays if then in the future. How do you maintain yeah. NPS that high? 95% yeah. is like crazy high. Definitely. So, of course, there is no one short answer for that. But just to highlight a few reasons. First of all, making sure that people understand that if they need to choose they are in front of a situation and need to choose, they need to think how they should react, prioritize what will save the NEPS. So for the right, you have more revenue. To the left, you have a more satisfied customer. So it's all about always prioritize the NEPS. This customer obsession is part of our culture. I like to say that we don't offer vaccine. We don't offer lab tests. What people really taste when they receive our team is our culture. So our culture goes inside our customer home and they can feel it. The first customer client that I need to delight is not the one that's paying the vaccine, it's my own team. Our nurse team, our turnover ratio is almost zero because we have these criteria, hiring process, vetting process, training, and we pay them more than that they used to earn in previous jobs. So we really value our team. And this team is proud of being part of BEP. And with this right culture, keep this NEPS above 95 across Brazil. And I like to always highlight that we don't deliver ice cream. We go inside your kid's bedroom we vaccinating them, injecting a virus, a bacteria. So we are not delivering ice a cream. A pleasant experience. Yeah, it would be a great NPS delivering ice cream. Sometimes when I talk to investors, I can see some of them like uh, this yellow flag. Oh, it's such a, a people intensive company. I rather invest in SaaS company, in software as a service company. And I say, hey man, definitely is a challenge, but it's also an entry barrier. Because someone that at least tried to copy Bib, we need to deal with this army of people. And this is all I am about. I'm all about discipline and it connects us with my previous experience as a military. So creating and maintaining this strong culture. You mentioned customer obsession. What are other most important elements of the culture, the way it exists at Bib? Amazing. So we have four core values there. So doing the right thing to always bring energy to the table. Oh, I love that. Yes, you know, because this is the only variable that we can control. There are a lot of variables that we cannot control, the, who's going to run the country, how the weather is, how the traffic is. So your energy, you can control. Discipline is a third core value because you can imagine that we need to commit with a standard. So imagine if one of my nurse decide to do something different because she believes it's better to do this way. Okay, you have voice here. Bring to us, let's discuss. If we change, we will change for the whole operation. Otherwise, keep doing our standard. There's no uh, flexibility regarding this. You have voice, but until your voice has been heard and we have changed the operation, 
you need to do exactly the way you're trained for. And the fourth one is resilience because I cannot tell them that it will be always sunny days. So if we, we are, as a team are together, we'll be able to go through all kinds of weather. When you look at the scope of your responsibilities as a CEO and as a founder, what's the hardest part of scaling BP, especially given where we are in the market cycle? If I was answering this question one year ago, I would say that we always have this main priority that is maintaining the culture strong. That's why I like to say that CEO, from my perspective, stands not for chief executive officer. I like to say that stands for chief evangelist officer. <laughs> we are always uh, reminding people what really we stands for and what are the core values, as we were discussing a few minutes before. Right now, I have this different answer because since 2022, February, March 2022, we need to change the strategy in order to balance growth and unit economics. So I believe that all founders in growth stage realize that the money would not be available as it was. So make And we sure don't even know when it's going to get available. I was in an event organized by Itaú BBA, one of the biggest uh, investment bank in Brazil. And someone told something that really resounded with me that if there is someone telling that here's what's going to happen, okay. stay away because uh, no one knows. So in a situation like this, I heard from Martin Scobar, just stay alive, don't die. He has seen things really worse than that, and the companies that thrive, that were able to overcome moments like these are big companies now. You mentioned that you had to change your strategy to balance profitability with unit economics. Definitely. What were the actual steps that you had to take? As we've discussed before, BP is such a people-intensive company, and we have these well-trained nurse workforce. So in order to capture growth, we needed to staff ahead. We were hiring much more people than we actually need in order to train those nurses and be able to capture the growth that we foresaw. When the winter came was, okay, unfortunately we cannot keep going on this strategy. So we lay off hundreds of people. I say that with all the respect because we are talking about human beings that lost their jobs. But unfortunately, it was necessary in order to show better unit economics, to show that we are a profitable and a positive cash flow company. And of course, in moments like these, you zero in on a lot of process that you have inside the company that can be more efficient. We have been doing that for the past 12 months, and we are now reaching the break-even. We don't need fresh investments. But we are all in the survive mode, balancing growth and unit economics. So first of all, I know that the topic of layoffs is a really hard topic and a lot of founders are not ready to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So I'm really grateful for you being honest. And before we move to the rapid fire, I want to ask for a piece of advice that you could have for founders who have to go through the same process where they have to lay off people to stay afloat. So what is the key piece of advice that you could give to people who have to go through that? Don't procrastinate. So be uh, radical, honest with you and your senior management team, how you see uh, things going on. And so just don't wait. When you know that you need to fire someone, just do uh, what you need to do and do it in a respectful manner, in a respectful way. Try to, to help in this outplacement, but make sure that you save the company. We are not focused on one specific person. Let's save the company, let's save the business. And then maybe in the future you can bring this person back. So with all the respect, but do the things that, the hard things that you need to do as a founder. So put in the interest of the company first. Actually, Lai, I have another question before we move to a rapid fire. And the question relates to the future of BP. Okay. So if everything goes right, if all measures in place were fruitful and your big dreams, big energy, what does the future look like? You mentioned that you want to be the super yeah. app. But if you look in terms of the product, Okay. Or in terms of the scale, where are you in 
2028, 2029. I want to be the go-to app for Brazilian, and not only where they will find the service, but they will find services at affordable price, great experience, all the, the results, the data will be organized, not fragmented as the old-fashioned way. So we will be able to rely on this data to help them navigate their own health. So we will start with this super app, but I believe it will be this must-have app regarding healthcare for all Brazilians. And regarding size, uh, I believe it will be thousands of employees and probably a listed company. So this is what I dream and what I work for. All right, let's move to the rapid fire. I'll ask you five short questions and I'll appreciate your immediate responses. Okay. Let's dive right in. The first question is, what's one book or piece of content every founder should read and why? This is always so difficult, so difficult. But the last one that comes to my mind, the Founder's Mentality from Chris Zuck. I never read it. What is it about? So it helps you spread literally the Founder's Mentality throughout the organization and keep you and make sure that it will be there even when you are not there anymore. So for me, I'm preparing this company to be able to survive without me. I don't see success when you need to be there to run the company. So Founder's Mentality from Chris Zuck was a great one. Great, I'm going to order it. Given where we are in the market cycle, what are your three pieces of advice to founders of growth stage companies who have to raise? Be profitable, be profitable, and be profitable. Definitely, you know more than me that venture capitalists, they have dry powder to deploy. They will deploy, if you, of course, be profitable and try to sustain a growth rate. Actually, I think it's just such a vanilla conditions mm -hmm. for growth stage investors who just raised in 2022 because they have such an incredible selection of companies. Yeah. They can be very picky, right? But mm -hmm. yeah, profitability, I hear you. When you hire people for leadership positions, what are the top three qualities that you are looking for in the candidates? Wow. Definitely, I want people that is mission driven. I really like that idea of missionaries and mercenaries. So... I know that I will not be able to pay the higher salary in the market, so definitely I need to find someone that connects with our purpose and our mission. And I really love people that learn fast. I don't want them to come up to me, work with me, knowing everything, but I like people that learn fast and great storytellers because they can learn and they can spread the word. So mission-driven, fast learners, and good storytellers. Very well. If you were to give a public talk okay. on a stage okay. and you could not talk about healthcare, venture capital, tech, or anything business related, what would you talk about? Family and spirituality. Then the last mm -hmm. one, which is my favorite, if you were an alcoholic beverage, mm -hmm. which beverage would you be and why? Definitely uh, gin and tonic. It's refreshing. So, gin and tonic, I, I want to be this kind of person, refreshing for everyone that I, I'm close and creates great memories. Vander, you mentioned in the very beginning that your like, day as a founder or your hours as a founder, it's a roller coaster. And I think one of the things that I'm super proud about this recording is that we were managed to capture this roller coaster. We talked about the highest of the highs. And the, lows of and the lowest of the lows. And Thank I'm you. really grateful for you being here today and being that brutally humble and transparent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Olga. Thank you for the invitation. Congrats for all the success of your podcast. 